so having I've never been subjected to listening to that aloud, I now have to go back to our website administrator and figure out how to change that bio because it's verbose and not all that informative, I think. But thank you for what, uh, introducing me. Uh, Anant did a, a great job of inspiring us, I think, about the possibilities of technology in education. I am here to be Debbie Downer and uh, play the role of the consultant. There's a reason consultants are not entrepreneurs. Uh, we find the problem in every new venture idea. Rob Goh, a former Parthenonian here, uh, now next few ventures actually was able to cure himself of that and now sees all the possibilities in new, in new, in new ventures. Uh, but uh, my skepticism is in part because of my disposition, but in part because I'm going to turn my attention to the K-12 market. In the K-12 market, unlike the higher ed market, operates a little differently and change, and let's be clear, Institutions with tenured faculty don't change very easily either, so it's still a long time coming. But at least the money follows the individual uh, student. And so you can start to see new things happening, and I think we're going to see change happen at a very rapid clip. I don't think we know exactly what it's going to look like. I think uh, folks like edX are going to learn uh, lots and lots from that big data, and are, what, it, what it looks like five years from now is going to be totally different and probably much more effective. In the K-12 market, because it's an institutional market with a huge amount of conservatism in terms of its ability, to ability and desire to take risks, it's worth taking an enormous grain of salt as we, uh, as we think about what's coming. But knowing that I'm preaching to the technology and education choir, uh, I don't want to get run out of here on a rail, so uh, first I'll raise some skeptical <coughs> points. But then I'll explain why I think uh, this time could be different and just challenge you with a couple of uh, imperatives that I think are important as you're a, uh, if you're an entrepreneur or uh, a leader in education, trying to think about how to get some change here. So are we there yet, and what do we do now? I will, without uh, too much of an advertorial for Parthenon, I'll give you a little bit of a sense of uh, what informs our perspective on all this. Uh, the Parthenon Group is a global strategy consulting firm. We work across a variety of industries, uh, but we have an uh, education practice that's one of our, most, uh, our largest practice areas. And over the years, we've done 700 uh, education assignments across the globe, spanning pre-kindergarten all the way through corporate training, but with the bulk of it happening in K-12 and post-secondary. And we work with uh, one of our unique characteristics, and the reason uh, I think we bring a little bit of a unique perspective on this topic is that we work across both the public sector and the private sector. So we work with the uh, leading education institutions like districts, states, universities. Then we also work with the companies that, and organizations that are trying to serve them. Uh, so um, based on that, we kind of have a good sense of what's happening on the front lines. And that is a little bit of why uh, I bring a little bit of skepticism here. So I, obviously, everyone here has read the headlines. We're all excited about the possibilities of technology and education. And uh, it's just around the corner, according to whatever you read in uh, the New York Times, Ed Surge, uh, what have you. Those of you who are like me, old enough to remember a time when uh, Google did not answer every question and you actually had to plan where to meet someone before you went to get them, might be uh, excused if you say, I think I've heard this before. Because for the last 30 years, we've heard exactly the same thing. Computers are going to change the classroom, a laptop education, a plugged-in generation. And even, and I'm not old enough to remember this, but even 100 years ago, Thomas Edison said, books will be obsolete. The motion picture, the talkies, are going to just pipe information and knowledge into people's heads. Well, it's been 100 years, and uh, I'm glad I didn't use it, because uh, not use the picture of the classroom. Uh, that's, that's another one I could have selected today, but it looks very much the same. I was in my son's uh, first grade classroom today, fabulous teacher, not at all different from what I experienced uh, when I was in first grade. So, you know, it, one of the things that is striking is that, is, as Anant uh, pointed out, every other industry has changed radically in that time. This is a little unfair, this is a study that's a little unfair to education, and it's sort of a, a stylized uh, analysis, but the Department of Commerce a few years back did an analysis of the relative intensity of IT use and IT equipment relative to personnel and FTEs. And educational services, sorry, um, 
Educational services is dead last in terms of the intensity of IT usage relative to everything else. The, the sad part is we're actually behind amusement and recreational services, so the carnival is actually more technologically advanced <laughs> than education. Now, this is a little old. It's, it's a very specific, the, the purpose of the study was actually something very different than this. So maybe we're being unfair to education, but it, it, it helps to illustrate a point that is undoubtedly true, that we haven't change the way we do things. We actually have invested a fair amount in technology. Uh, I think it's since uh, over, uh, over the last 20 years or so, about 40 million computers put into classrooms, $60 billion of technology in the classroom itself. But that's overwhelmed by an increase in spending, uh, or more than doubling of spending on K-12 education, with very little to show for it in terms of results. Um, so, you know, 1990, uh, 91 school year, we spent about $200 billion on K-12 education. We more than doubled it by 2008, 2009, which is the last publicly government-sponsored uh, data available. And over that time, the structure, the underlying structure of how we spent that money changed virtually not at all. What the change you'll notice is that employee benefits takes up a bigger piece of the personnel, but it's 80% on people. And so what we've done is we've thrown more and more people at the problem. I want to be clear, and I actually practiced this for my son this morning. He said, are you saying we shouldn't have teachers anymore? And that's not what I'm saying. But we are putting people into the same delivery structure, if you will, for education. Without changing the underlying delivery structure, that's like pounding your head against the wall. It's not going to change outcomes. So it's easy to beat up on the education sector. It's easy to beat up on K-12 systems. Ah, oh, they're so silly. Other industries figure this out. There are very rational and actually laudable reasons why K-12 education changes at a fairly glacial pace. First off, institutional markets behave differently. Uh, this was a challenge for me and some of our private sector uh, clients would all read the Steve Jobs book uh, by Walter Isaacson and say, what if it's that the customers don't know what they don't know? Well, the problem is your customers in K-12 education, and, and Bill from Pearson, he knows this, they know what they need to know because they have to put an RFP out publicly six months in advance, a year in advance. They say exactly what they want, and if they diverge from that, they get in trouble. So they don't behave like consumer markets, so the tipping point argument is a lot harder in K-12 education. Secondly, the people making those decisions and drafting those RFPs and, may, and, and sort of sorting through all these potential ideas are innovation resistant. And frankly, as a parent, I kind of want that. I don't want someone trying out every new idea on my kid. Your kid's OK, but not my kid. So and it, actually, Jack Markell, who's the governor of Delaware, had a long career in private sector and then uh, went into public service. And he had a great example for this. He said, look. In the private sector, I could take a risk, and I had downside risk, but I absolutely had a lot of upside benefit. In the public sector, if I'm sitting here trying to decide a new curriculum or something else, it's all downside risk for me. So it's understandable the kind of decisions that a lot of public sector uh, K-12 uh, systems are making. And then finally, even if you get to sort of buy the new system, it's really hard to change practice in the K-12 system. We have one of the largest workforces in the country in the form of K-12 teachers. They work fairly independently, and that's, that's something we talk about differently, but they work fairly independently, mostly artisans, and they also are reasonably conservative in their approach. They don't want to screw things up for those kids either. And so to change practice is really hard. The perfect example of that is, uh, you know, smart boards had a great run putting smart boards into classrooms. But walk into 100 classrooms of smart boards, you'll find maybe 5 to 10% that are really taking advantage of the power of that smart board. Another 20 are using it on occasion, frankly, to replace handing out uh, uh, dittos. Now I am, now I am dating myself. <laughs> Those of, you, those of you who know, remember the smell of the, yeah, exactly, Eileen remembers the smell. Of, even when I taught, I still was cranking those things out. Um, and, and most of, you know, hung posters on the darn thing or, or scrawled on it by accident. So these are reasons that make it understandable why things haven't changed. 
And uh, therefore, technology remains at the periphery of the learning experience. And you'll come into many classrooms and find the tech corner. This was taken by a Parthenon associate in her Baltimore classroom uh, not two years ago. Um, so now that I've brought us all down to earth, why would it be different this time? And there are some real reasons why I think it could be different this time. And I think there are conditions that make it possible. And then frankly, it's the people in this room, the people in systems today and other entrepreneurs, and hopefully the entrepreneurs in schools that are going to take advantage of these conditions. First, the infrastructure has, in fact, improved. We've got a lot more devices. The cost of devices is coming down. Putting computing power into individual students' hands and getting close to one-to-one -one or to one-to-one. -one. And I know Anthony Kim from Education Elements, they've found lots of ways to do really interesting things, even without one-to-one. -one. But even getting to one-to-one -one, has happened in a lot of places and is going to happen reasonably soon. Don't think we're there yet, because uh, bandwidth remains a problem, particularly that sort of last mile bandwidth. Um, one of the projects we did was helping School of One in New York City get off the ground. And I had the, uh, frankly, really entertaining job of interviewing principals throughout the New York City system to find pilot sites. But one of the big problems, beyond finding a principal that was not, uh, you know, was going to be good to work with, uh, was the fact that you couldn't get bandwidth in more than half of the schools that was sufficient to do the kinds of interesting things you want to do. So we're getting there, but we're not quite there yet. We're going to have a continued focus on outcomes. And that's important. And I, like, I, li I love the fact that Anant mentioned outcomes in higher ed. I'll just take a brief diversion there. It's so interesting that in higher ed now, we finally have professors thinking about how good is the actual instruction in education going on? Because we work with a lot of institutions where we go in and the faculty say, well, we can't go online. What about quality? They say, well, how do you define quality today? Is it just the sort of exposure to your brilliance in a room? No one has any sense of whether people are actually learning, and nor have they really focused on teaching. Uh, and I think online and higher education is going to change that, particularly because of the big data. You're going to see what happens with these folks. Um, but in K-12, outcomes are have been there, and they're going to continue to be there, particularly if the Common Core has teeth. And I'll come back to that in a moment. A really important factor in the last few years has been the fact that cost pressures have mounted. Five years ago, when we went into a K-12 school district, I felt reasonably comfortable saying I could take 10% of cost out of that pretty quickly. They have done that work over the last five years. They have cut, they have, you know, they have gotten run cost savings out of purchasing. They've cut unnecessary central office staff. The only thing that remains really is class size reduction. Um, and they're just finally saying, I need to find different ways of doing what I'm doing as opposed to one teacher and 25 students at all times. So those cost pressures, I think, could be the, the part that really is the camel that gets the, or the, sorry, the straw that gets the camel to get out of the barn to mix my metaphors. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and then a really important piece here, and it, it, it's a little bit about the consumers in an institutional market, but the user comfort is increasing. And that's both the students, and they're off the charts ready and willing to do this. I think Anant mentioned that you know, his students are, would prefer to text, to prefer to be online. In fact, many institutions have found when they put a course online and also have it in class, on-ground campus students actually prefer to take it online. So the students are comfortable. But now, as teachers retire, we've got a big wave of retirements coming in K-12, more and more teachers are comfortable and frankly find it just like breathing to use technology. So that's going to change things as well. And we are, partly because of this and partly for just the entrepreneurial sort of pluck of these folks, seeing you know, early stages of change. I'll just run through some examples. School of One I mentioned is now better classrooms. Uh, some of you may have read about this. It's, it's sort of generating essentially an individualized playlist for every student. They've started with math and are moving on. Um, Rocket Ship Education has been in the news recently. They are really going through the messy process of innovation, and they've actually sort of junked their old model. Not junked their old model, but they're really thinking differently about how they're going to do things. But ultimately, it's, they're looking at how they use people and time and technology in different ways. And it's a charter school network out in California about to move to Milwaukee. Carpe Diem is, if you want to see something that really is different, check out the Carpe Diem site. Uh, this is, it, it works obviously more at the high school level, that's where they are. It is truly individualized, sort of self-directed movement through uh, high school. It's 
it's, it's not for the faint of heart, because if you walk in, it looks totally different than a normal high school. It looks like a cube farm. And you've got students at their cubes, doing their work, and then they have uh, conference rooms around the side. And they call conferences, depending on where different students have different uh, issues to work on. Very different, uh, getting some interesting results, still early stage, but uh, worth checking out. Uh, Mooresville, North Carolina, is you know, all the rest of these have been charter schools. Uh, or, uh, the, the, sorry, Carpe Diem and, um, and Rockship are charter schools. School of One actually works within public schools. Mooresville is the first district that's really done something really out there. Uh, and essentially, they had a great partnership with Apple. They've put uh, technology in every kid's hands and have truly gone to a student-driven model. Um, and it's, it's interesting to watch there as well. And you know, sort of the, the crowning thing that could really push us forward here is the Race to the Top District uh, grant process that just completed. 16 districts have fairly aggressive plans to, uh, to personalize learning in, in different ways, often using technology. And how those go, I think you know, there's a danger that some of these flop and everyone says, see, I told you this wasn't going to work. But if they are successful, I think we could really see some, some proof points. Uh, I, as, as late as sort of three months ago, I thought these were sort of points of isolated proof points out there, and we still had a huge convincing job for the vast majority of district folks. We've recently been doing some work with the Gates Foundation Next Generation Models team, uh, trying to understand how do you get uh, districts to adopt more personalized, truly blended learning kind of models that use technology, that use time, that use space, and use people in different ways. And we described sort of a model of this based on the KIPP and Power model to a number of different, uh, uh, a, dist a nationwide sample of district leaders as well as school leaders, and the results were reasonably similar. And we said, you know, first, is this appealing to you, this model we've described? 94% of the district leaders said, this is an appealing strategy to me. If we'd asked that two years ago, I, I really doubt we would have seen the above 50. 56%, this was surprising, have implemented what they thought of as blended learning in their district. Now, this is one where you have to take it with a reasonable grain of salt, and I think we run into the risk of things that are being called blended learning, getting implemented, not showing much results, and then sort of uh, besmirching the whole movement. But for better or for worse, the, you know, uh, the ship has sailed here. People are trying this, often in pilots, not district-wide, but, it, but it's happening. And then 20%, and this I think is the more honest answer, uh, is probably inflated, think that what they're doing is truly transformative as opposed to kind of working around the edges. So you know, it's easy for folks to say, yes, yeah, is appealing to me. The, the next piece of information we got back from district leaders actually really surprised me. And I think it's driven in large part because of that uh, cost pressure that we referred to earlier. And we asked, you know, which is sort of a forced choice uh, for um, your strategies to improve performance and student outcomes? And it was, could, if you could take the dollars and invest in lower class size versus uh, increasing technology use. And 83% chose increasing technology use. So that says to me that those of you who are entrepreneurs and say, I can't get people to uh, listen to me, they're out there waiting to hear the story. Um, it also says to me from a foundation and public policy standpoint, we've got to be really careful. Because we're in this point where if a lot of schlock goes out there, it's going to be totally discredited and will retrench back to uh, some other strategy pretty quickly. So um, I'll, I'll sort of wrap up by, you know, for the entrepreneurs who are in the crowd, and you know, again, take this you know, what, for what it's worth um, in that uh, consultants are not the best entrepreneurs, because if we, if we were, we'd probably be doing what you're doing. But having worked with a lot of commercial vendors in this space, a couple thoughts on what to focus on. Uh, to be successful in this market. The first is you've got to focus on the performance gap and the achievement gap. Uh, that is still the number one topic, the number one agenda item on all district leaders' uh, 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 um, agendas. Second point is drive towards personalization. We talked about, I'll talk about my, just a couple more comments on that in a moment. The third is get closer to the point of instruction. When you're way out here as a textbook, you're pretty far away. In a world of outcomes, you need to get close to the point of instruction, both to have more control, but also because there's more dollars there. And then finally, you've got to fit into, enhance, or at your peril, change the teaching and learning workflows. 
uh, and I'll talk about that in a moment as well. This is, uh, I couldn't do a presentation without putting a probably uh, indecipherable bubble chart up there. This is just to uh, illustrate the point that not only is achievement gap still front and center for folks, if in fact the common core assessments or the common assessments have teeth, because we've got a couple steps between the common core and actual rubber hitting the road. We've got to have folks adopt the common core. Then we've got to develop the common assessments. Then you have to, and I think, it, uh, I can't remember who it was, maybe Checker or Finn wrote something recently, you've got to set the cut scores. And if we end up with common cut scores at what we think are true levels of proficiency, you're going to see almost every state, as we sort of use NAEP as a proxy for, uh, uh, for what the uh, sort of high level common core uh, cut score would be, every state would see you know, the difference between themselves uh, and, their, and the common core going down. So they're all going to see scores go down. And so the example here, you know, Massachusetts has actually got pretty high standards, so they don't move very much. Texas has reasonably low standards as measured by sort of their, te their state's test scores relative to the NAEP. They're going to feel the pinch very hard if the Common Core uh, has teeth. And then along the x-axis, you can see the change in per-student spending. So the folks over here on the left side of the chart have to literally do a lot more with a lot less. So finding solutions for them is going to be uh, a valuable exercise. Um, we t I'll just give a, take a slight detour on personalization. Um, personalization is sort of a very commonsensical idea. Uh, Benjamin Bloom, a researcher in the 80s, looked at, did, did a tutoring experiment where they had a control group in a regular class, and then they tutored kids in one to one, to one or one to three environments. The kids who got tutoring, not surprisingly, in that personalized environment, got two, standards devia two standard deviations more of growth in that time. It's pretty commonsensical, right? If I'm trying to teach this entire group and move along at the same pace, you know, those of you who are really far ahead are going to be bored. Those of you who are way behind are going to tune out. And I might, if I'm a really great, te great teacher, sort of pace it and, and pitch it at 60% of the audience. Personalization is to try to increase learning productivity. And I thought it was a good point that I not made, and I want to echo it. Everyone jumps to the efficiency argument. And yeah, you could use this to use fewer teachers. The real argument ought to be, I can use this to make the teachers I have that much more productive. Right? So the other point I want to make when you hear about personalized learning is it's not new. Good teachers have done this for years and years. They knew where you were and where another student was. Um, the, uh, the problem is you can't scale that. And so technology gives us the opportunity to scale it. Um, and to that point, technology has got to be the means to an end. The problem that I'm worried about is in this, part of the schlock I'm worried about is it's going to be iPads for everyone and let the magic happen. And that doesn't change workflows. It doesn't change uh, the delivery system. And it really isn't going to get you much benefit, I don't believe. Uh, and then uh, not re reference big data. I, I can't stress enough how important the I part of IT is in this as opposed to the T. The T is the delivery mechanism. The information you're getting is what's going to drive continuous improvement and help us figure out new and better ways to, to teach and learn. So final point, uh, uh, two more points. Uh, getting close to the point of instruction. I made, I made the point, if you're in the uh, textbook business, you're up here, maybe $50 to $150 per student. Pearson has figured this out. And they own a Connections Academy right now. That gets the full per pupil amount. That is a much, when people draw uh, 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 connections between the healthcare market and the uh, education sector, they say they're both enormous parts of GDP. Problem is, if you then take the education sector and narrow it down to what vendors can actually get, it's a reasonably small piece unless you expand it to the full per pupil amount. So from a commercial standpoint, that's important. In a world of outcomes, you also want to be closer to the point of instruction because if you put a product out there and people don't use it well, you're the one that's going to get blamed. So the flippant way I think of that is, in a world of outcomes, you don't want to be uh, an arms dealer to people who can't shoot straight. If you can actually do the teaching and learning, you can get a lot closer uh, to success. And then finally, I want to talk about the, the teaching workflow. And this is a place where, you, as an entrepreneur, you have to take one of two paths. The simplest path, if I'm advising you from a commercial perspective, is don't try to screw up the workflow. If you try to change the way a teacher works, 
it is going to be incredibly hard for you to get traction. Therefore, the things that have worked best, things like Study Island, Renaissance Learning, they work because I can send the kid to the back of the classroom and, and they'll work and it just all works. It might even make my life easier as a teacher. Administrative workflows, the same thing. I say this uh, and, and it's a little hard to give this advice because I actually don't think that's going to change the system very much. And so if you're, a, if you're a small vendor trying to get into a school, try to work with the workflow. But if you really want to change the way things are happening, you actually have to change the way the school works. And so one of my little pet peeves that I'll close on is we talk about all of you in the room and Sal Khan and others as the entrepreneurs. And they are. But from, from this perspective, I'll just leave you with this closing thought that if we really want to have big change in this, we need the entrepreneurs to be the people in the classroom. Everyone else is vendors that they can use to put together a really new thing that gets you huge gains in learning productivity and changes the trajectory that we're on. So that's uh, what I've got to say. Hopefully we're in time and happy to take some questions. Th thanks, Seth. I appreciate it. Uh, Kwesi, sorry, reforming consultant myself, so um, <laughs> I'm, I'm recovering all the time. Uh, one of the things I wanted to you know, talk about or ask about was, was, was evidence, uh, or potentially even the la lack thereof. Uh, you talked about risk and sort of uh, the, the adoption or the, the willingness for people to actually take change or a cha change their practice. And one of the things my old boss, Jim Shelton, who I think many of you in the room already know, uh, talked about the difficulty of actually exporting a practice. It's easy to export products, but it's harder to export practice. Uh, and one of the reasons is because we have this evidence framework, which is a problem for us in ed tech. Uh, there is a gold standard randomized control trial, which takes X amount of years. And by the time you finish the RCT, on the Palm Pilot, who's using the Palm Pilot three years later. Uh, so the question I would have is, you know, can, us as, can we as entrepreneurs actually leap over the evidence framework and actually get penetration? And if not, what sort of things do we need to be arguing for with regard to evidence so we can get, you know, academicians and, and people to actually buy in our stuff uh, without minimizing the, ri minimize yeah. the risk? Yeah, I wish, I mean, it's a, it's, it is a great point. I don't have a great answer for you, but I, I will say it's something that's, frustrated me uh, for many years working in the K-12 system is that everything has to be that longitudinal randomized control study. And back, back to that sort of R that kludgy RFP process, what you find is everyone says, oh, we need this to be data-based, data research-based research new system. In reality, the folks making the decisions can't really you know, de define whether that's good research or bad research. It becomes a bit of a check the box thing but we still keep holding everything to that standard. And I, I would love to see a world in which public sector officials can say, I don't know for sure this is going to work, but I know it worked in this district, or is starting to show promise. I know it worked in this district, is starting to show promise, and we're going to try it. And the other, the other problem that always frustrates me with that is usually the answer that comes from those randomized control studies is, well, it depended on how it was implemented. Of course it depended on how it was implemented, right? And this is a place where I think the private sector is much better at saying, look, I need to jump on this before my competitor does, whether or not I'm sure it's going to work, because I have, en I have enough belief in evidence that it is. I don't have a great solution, though, because people are always going to get shot at if they, if they go with their gut and it doesn't work. I mean, the best way to handle it is doing those sort of uh, pilots uh, in, a, in a big district that allow it to show that there is some promise and you sort of create internal demand. That's my best solution on that. Or that's part of the, part of the possibility of having more portfolio-oriented districts where you can have more larger scale experiments, if you will, that people essentially opt into so there's a little less risk on that. That's a great question. Uh, yes? Hi, Seth. Uh, my name is Herschel, and I'm an entrepreneur um, building a math company called Tuva Labs. And we're actually doing uh, beta pilots in eight schools in New York City. Great. So a lot of it, what Are you, you doing said, it in the innovation zone? Not yet, in, okay. in public schools around, uh, around the other five boroughs, yep. not in the I-Zone. And a lot of what you said uh, rings true uh, in terms of uh, adoption and engagement. My, my question is to the follow-up to the previous one, which is, uh, you know, we've been working with these teachers and schools for about seven months now, and we're going to be continuing to work with them throughout the rest of this academic year. And now we're starting to get into the qualitative studies and being able to uh, show some data on increased engagement, increased motivation in terms of math learning. 
Um, is there any movement uh, along with uh, maybe on the federal level or in the private sector where there's innovation in terms of how research is done, maybe tools, maybe frameworks, maybe some resources that we can use um, to make this entire process uh, better, more efficient, and less expensive for us? Yeah, I, there's nothing yet, I don't think. I know that I hear some folks in the foundation world trying to think about how do you create, in essence, lab space, if you will, in a kind of quick turnaround prototyping kind of world. I don't know if that's exactly what you're talking about, but right. I, I, I think I think it's people are thinking about it, but it's not it's not there yet. Uh, it's it, the reality is you kind of have to go out there and prove it little by little. And the challenge for entrepreneurs is you don't have the feet on the street. You know, the big guys do so. Finding a way to almost play jujitsu there and get, I, I think the, the, the smaller companies that I've seen really work well um, are the ones that get, that sort of use the teachers themselves as the sales force. Um, and that's becoming more and more uh, possible. And I think another thing that came out of some of this work is uh, how much the trust of peer to peer networks matters right now. And so my best advice for small, small firms is you try to create you know, kind of a, and I still think geography matters in that case, both from your ability to service it, but then also the network effect. And to try and create those beachheads in certain places and amplify those networks of, of reference clients, uh, and that's an important way. Um, I think Edmodo, uh, Tarunia's here from Edmodo, they're seeing such great growth in large part because teachers are thirsty to talk to one another about these things. So I think that's, that would be the only way I can think of to do it. Uh, hi, Seth. Um, I'm a senior. My name is Kyle at the University of Rochester, and I'll actually be doing Teach for America next year. Um, and my question for you is that uh, the U.S. is kind of behind uh, other countries such as China, um, some other countries in Europe. And is there any elements of the education systems in those countries that's technologically focused that has really been a kind of uh, an element of their success that uh, I guess all the entrepreneurs in the room can kind of kind of gear their perspective towards? Yeah, I, the short answer is no. I mean, I would add a grain of salt to the international comparisons. I, I do fundamentally believe this is a competitiveness, issue, a competitiveness issue, but the reality is, in fairness, and this is one of the few times you'll hear me agree with Diane Ravitch, but in fairness, you know, not every student in Shanghai was tested, right? We test all our students. So you've got to take these with a grain of salt. Nonetheless, particularly in math and science, we have a huge competitiveness issue. Mm -hmm. Right now, to my knowledge, internationally, that's still, we're probably further along on the technology front than, than most uh, places internationally. Um, that's not to say there might be some uh, places, but I think there are other factors at work there that would take a long time to get into. <laughs> okay, thank you. Hey Seth, uh, my name is Tony and I'm with uh, EdSurge. Um, so um, I want to ask you a question because we're from I'm in the Bay Area and in the Silicon Valley there's this you know mentality where you know you don't well, we think that we don't have to play by the rules that we can sidestep institutions. So what I've been seeing is a lot of ed tech startups kind of try to go directly to teachers and have their products in classrooms or pockets of classrooms. But you know long term wise, how how viable or sustainable do you think this is? And I mean, how long do you think? Uh, before that uh, startups can actually start going from the top down? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and uh, I will say that I have evolved on this to take a political answer. Uh, I used to think that that was folly because the budgets are, con are controlled at the district level typically, the big budgets. I, am, I think I'm being proven a little bit wrong by a lot of the folks that are going directly to, uh, to teachers. What I also see is, uh, at least three or four years ago, every venture capitalist, if you talked about K-12 age students, they actually wanted to go to B to C. I think what people found is there's only so much market there. What they do is they extrapolate out, well, I spend 80 grand on my kid's education. Well, you're a very small sliver of Upper West Side Manhattan. Uh, <laughs> the money is in the institutional market. So the question is, how do you get at it? And, what I've found is it, maybe not a teacher by teacher strategy, but a building by building strategy seems to be working in a lot of places where if you can get your product down to sort of under the $5,000 mark, maybe under 10,000, uh, principals tend to have budget authority up to about that point. And you know, 
you can cut through a lot of red tape if you go right to that principle and say, I can solve your problem, and I'm going to get it you know, implemented. Now, it requires a very light touch sales model. This has got to be something you can sell over the phone, for example, or by Skype, not to be too much of a Luddite. But, uh, but if you can do that, I think you can start to build up critical mass where you can go up to the district side. I'm curious, if for, uh, Tarunya can answer this tomorrow, maybe from Edmodo. I don't yet have a lot of examples of those folks like Edmodo or Schoology that have done the you know, freemium model, get enough critical mass in a district and convert it to a big district contract. If you see that happening, you say, you know what, that did work. But I will say there's, it's getting such traction, I think there may be more to that than I, than I would have given credit to five years ago. It's, it's certain, back to the sort of jujitsu concept for a smaller firm playing against Boemis with 400 person sales forces. That is a great uh, strategy if it works. Sorry, go ahead. Hi, Chris Kelly with Magic Software. Um, I work for a company that does a lot of work in helping com companies take their products mobile. And when I look around the room here, I see people working on computers, but also- I was offended, by the way, I was offended by that, but yeah. <laughs> I see a lot of people working on, um, people who are working on computers as well as mobile devices. And want to kind of get your take on what type of impact mobile is going to play in trying to get technology into the classroom. Yeah, I, that's not something I'm particular ex, particularly expert in. I, I, you know, even just here locally, Wellesley, it's not mobile, but they sort of tried to go with BY, bring your own device, the BYOD, BYOD movement. And then I just saw a headline that they, they were going to have everyone buy iPads, which, you know, if any, just, if any district could, Wellesley probably would be it. Um, and they had to backtrack because people said they, they didn't want to do it. So I think we're still reasonably far away from not provisioning stuff. It's not exactly your question, but I think we're still reasonably far away from a true BYOD. That's one man's opinion. I haven't looked deeply at it. Where I think mobile might be more interesting is internationally, where it sort of jumps, it sort of leapfrogged. And so if you look at some of the interesting international plays, that are particularly around English language, I think a mobile play there is, is particularly interesting. But I, I, I don't know. We'll see. I, I do think there's just a level. This is has nothing to do with the work I do, just personally, and again, I'm the guy who's like still uses a Blackberry, so, but personally, I, I think creating content is hard to do on a mobile device. That said, my daughter on a Kindle Fire has now written six chapters of her book with her thumbs, so <laughs> this may change. Thanks. I guess last one. Oop. Yeah. Uh, Seth, I uh, do agree with you know your skepticism about the institutional market, but obviously, as you said, you know the money is there. My question is, you have briefly touched about it. Uh, instead of viewing you know, education as an institutional market, you know, you know why isn't educational uh, B two C as a consumer market? Why is that not clicking? Why why do you think that might not work? Why didn't work earlier? Why wouldn't parents buy thirty bucks for a algebra? Uh, you know. Uh, yeah. No. Course? It's it, it, it's. At least to date, it's a nice little market, but it's a little market. And so the app world is a you know there's uh, some of the great apps in the uh, uh, the uh, app store uh, iTunes app store are things like uh, Oregon Trail and some of these um, uh, sort of learn learn your math, learn your reading kind of stuff. Now there's a challenge for those because there's they're a dime a dozen, almost literally 99 cents, and it's hard to sort through what's good and what's not. The, the real challenge with that market is it's still pretty small. Um, and in the US, people don't tend to uh, broadly spend a ton on education. And a perfect example in the analog world is places like uh, Sylvan Learning Systems. They're having a hard slog because you get so big and you find all the striver middle class folks that want to pay the money to do it. And that market just tends to be more constrained. So now. You can imagine a world where the district system is totally blown up and you really, you know, every person's got their money to spend on education and you'd see a whole different story. But right now, the, the institutional spending just dwarfs the, what's, actually, what's actually shelled out of people's pockets, um, domestically at least. If I could quickly follow. Sure. So, uh, so you know, I don't know if it's, what stops a parent from spending that extra dollar? Because, you know, there are, you know, Korea is one country, extra tuitions after school, there's, you know, parents spend a lot of money. So is, is there, why won't a parent spend? Yeah, we start to get into uh, uncomfortable cultural issues, but the problem is people are spending it on cons consumption. 
and not education. It's just, we don't, I mean, we, relative to a place like Korea, which where you're right, I mean, they, those cram schools bang them out from, uh, from four to seven at night. They had to literally mandate that they close at 10 p.m. because parents couldn't get enough of that. Um, in India, certain segments of the population spend much more out of pocket on their education than uh, we do in the U.S. It just is the fact that right now we don't, I mean, it's, it's a, I would argue it's a national crisis that we don't value education enough, both in terms of what we put towards it in an institutional setting and in terms of what people spend. But at least every time we've looked at it, and trust me, I've got clients who live on the upper, side, upper west side of Manhattan who say, but look, it's got to be big. And we come back every time and say, we've looked at it six ways to Sunday. It's just not that big, and it's just not growing that fast. Uh, so, Seth, we oh, have yeah. time for one last question. Uh, we got some feedback from the audience. Uh, people wanted to know, what do you think is the coming impact uh, of mobile, since most of what you talked at and what we saw on the screen was desktop, laptop solutions. What are the, what's the tablet market, the mobile market? What's yeah, yeah I, I, uh, you may have missed it. We, 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 I tried to address that. I don't have a great perspective on it, um, except to say that I think people are still uncomfortable with the ability to create in the mobile setting and that inability to create. But again, that's, that's not really my ballywick. I don't, I'm not good at sort of future-oriented things around tech, so I don't want to kill the dreams of all the mobile technology folks here, because you may be very well be right. I just I think it's going to take a little while. So one last question, actually. I mean, okay. uh, this so is like bedtime at the Reynolds house home. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, so you mentioned you, you sort of ended your keynote with uh, the role of teachers, and that's very important because I mean, in higher ed, you're seeing some sort of resistance in Minnesota. Uh, if you heard about you know their resistance to MOOCs, I mean, do you see that kind of resistance at some point coming from teachers? Uh, teachers. You know, I mean, you have to understand that some of the teachers don't, don't do that well with technology. So there's this fear that the computer is going to come in and they're going to replace us. And the way the policy is going, that's sort of the idea is because it's easier to throw money than to train good quality teachers. So how do you think there will be a balance um, between our synergy between technology and teachers? And how can technology be, be effective, effective in creating quality teachers? So, so the second question is a, a different one. Let me start with the first one. So I think... It, it was really interesting through th Race to the Top and the district competition. Unions caused a lot of issues for districts in terms of signing up. They needed to get a union signature to submit. And L.A. sort of famously submitted without the signature, wrote a letter, said, you know, Secretary Duncan, please don't, you know, penalize the kids of Los Angeles because our district didn't want to sign on. But we actually were involved with some of the districts in California. The union wasn't worried about, oh, you're trying to replace teachers, which is what I thought they would have been worried about. They were using this purely as leverage because they don't want uh, to use student value added data in evaluations, which is interesting. So it was, it was purely sort of a timing issue that the grant around personalized learning got a lot of union pushback, but it was really about prior waves of grants that they were arguing about. Um, I think eventually unions are going to say, hey, you're trying to replace the teacher. To date, you don't hear that that much, in part because I think a lot of the proponents are extra specially careful not to portray it that way. Um, I personally don't think we need to portray it that way. I do think we need to think about using people in different ways uh, and using the technology to make good teachers great and great teachers excellent. And I do personally think that and I know we're live streaming, but I do personally think that where you have an option between amplifying the, exp the sort of reach of a really excellent teacher and minimizing the reach or eliminating a teacher who's really not good, as we sort of put this together with the, the teacher effectiveness work, I, I, I would make that choice every time. Um, I don't know where we'll go with that. In terms of making teachers better, I think a lot of it depends on whether we can, and this is why you can't, you can't do this within the current workflow, which is why I'm ambivalent about this workflow point. It depends on whether we can come to a place where we have truly different roles for adults in a school. Right now, you're a teacher on day one, you teach those 25 kids. You're a teacher on day you know, 30, or year 30, you teach those 25 kids. And you do everything. You have to be a fire, you gotta be able to present. You gotta be able to grade and give feedback. You gotta be able to counsel. What you could imagine happening is really sort of uh, atomizing those roles a little bit and saying, you're excellent at presenting information. You can't relate to a kid if their life depended on it. And I'm going to have you do that, right? We are so far from having that. And, I, and sort of to apply this to the 
teacher effectiveness movement and compensation reform, I'm afraid a lot of places are kind of leaping into, oh, we're going to create different roles. And you're going to end up with essentially no-show job kind of roles uh, that aren't really effective and actually end up costing us more as opposed to less. So that's where I get back to. If you really want to use adults differently, the unit of change is the school. And so the is back to the point. You need the entrepreneurs to be those people creating new school models that really use people, time, space, and technology differently and reimagine, what do I want a student to have after they spend three years in this middle school and work backwards from that? That's, that, by the way, is not the way to get rich quick. So thank thanks. Thank you very much, Seth.